So hello everyone. So thanks for coming. The, so um, so the presentation is about making IoT grid again, and especially how we worked on this EV charger. Uh, and we'll explain a bit the story of what happens and, and the journey we, we had, and also some thoughts. So the idea is not really to focus so much on the appliance itself, uh, but some thoughts on what we have observed and an issue. Uh, just as a small disclaimer, uh, so the aim is not, uh, first of all, it does not reflect the, the opinion of my employers and what we are doing in, uh, in our daily business. Uh, so it just comes from a customer having an issue with this, this product. We don't want to judge the company or the companies uh, involved, and especially the one behind the product. Uh, it's a bit of a sad story uh, that we'll explain. And all the effort that we have done were mostly to save the appliance from going to trash uh, and nothing else. So what we are, we will not discuss so much, it's in my dad. Uh, so both of us work on it together. So both of us are on the pictures. Uh, I'll let you guess who is who. Uh, <laughs> So that's, uh, so both of us have um, some technical backgrounds and, uh, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, so the, con the what we'll cover today is the story of Power Dale Alexander Home, which is this product, uh, what happened to the company. Then the way we have looked for a way to recover the product and make it functional again, uh, which will bring us to some design choices and the impact it may have on IoT today. So the choice they have made, uh, is a choice that many product uh, designers still do, and it may have consequence if you go on bankrupt or if certain services uh, become useless uh, or are not available any longer. And then we just conclude with that. Uh, so about the story, uh, about a year ago, a bit more, uh, so the company called Powerdale, which was the designer of this product, uh, went on bankrupt, so the company stopped its operation. Uh, and in a nutshell, the ecosystem was made of three components. So on one side, you had the EV charger itself. Uh, so this is the home version. They have also a professional version that they were installing for companies, uh, parking lots, um, shops, and so on and so forth. They had this next move platform that still exists. It was taken over by a Luxembourgish company called MyDiego. Uh, and next move was also made, so it's actually made to collect uh, data from several types of appliance. The one from PowerDale, obviously, but also the one from other vendors. And typically, they use the standard of CPP uh, protocol that was discussed, I uh, think, yesterday or the day before in one of the Lightning Talks. Uh, and then you had the customer had the app, or the installer also had an app, and the application was basically connecting to um, the charger over Bluetooth or energy, getting telemetry back should the appliance uh, would not be connected to the Wi-Fi network and uploading all the data back to, to my Diego platform where they were doing the statistics, uh, report, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all of that is quite important. Uh, so that's the three elements you have uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, so in terms of timeline, uh, as I mentioned, June 23, uh, per day one bankrupt, uh, is the company stopped its operations. Uh, while after my Diego took over next move, so only the platform, the cloud platform, no one is, uh, t took over or took back the physical product from, from Powerdale. Uh, as of February 24, my Diego decided to kill the account of Powerdale customers on, on the cloud platform. Um, and then a bit later, they also issued over internet, uh, a downgrade command to all the appliance limited the charge, uh, to maximum six number, which is the, bar minimum if you still want to charge a car, but which is a bit useless. So basically the screenshot is what you now have if you start the, the app. You just cannot do anything. You'll get stuck with this login screen, uh, and there is no way for you to to operate with the appliance. Um, so and by default, if the box received that command, there was no way actually to still charge your car properly. Uh, so the impact was quite heavy. So this is a hardware that was sold for about 50,000, um, so 50,000 times, mostly in Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, so it's quite impactful in many houses, and especially for the, the one that do have, uh, electric car. The reseller also had heavy stock. So some reseller also tried to help the company by buying heavy stocks, uh, making huge stock of the appliance, which means that they have huge stock of those appliance in stock, uh, which are becoming useless. And in the case of some of the installers, they even went prosecuted by their customers. So there were heavy tension 
between the owner of the appliance um, that had those appliances useless and the one that were installing the appliance that are also a bit the victim of all of that. Um, and there was no way, by the way, to, to set back the settings because the installer themselves lost the access. They also needed this cloud access to, to have a change, to change and configure the appliance. Customer doesn't have this access. Uh, and on the customer side, uh, with six ampere, you can kind of charge your car, but if you use a regular plug, you get the same, same kind of, um, power. So the, the use of this, uh, this appliance is, uh, is limited. Uh, also to be noted that the appliance are two mode. If you were a lucky one, the box was configured in open mode, which means that whenever you plug your car, uh, the card will load. Uh, so they even, uh, we'll see a bit different mode after. But basically open, there is no authentication. You plug your car, as soon as you have power, the car will charge. Uh, and then you add the close mode, uh, where it won't charge until you authenticate to the appliance, which is what you commonly do when your appliance is exposed um, on the street, uh, if you have a public spot and you don't want anyone to charge. Um, so that's a bit the situation. So some are even unable to charge a car uh, due to this absence of cloud authentication. Uh, and it's where you start to see a bit of the issue. So the official advice, let's trash it. Uh, that's what Testa Shaw, even the Union World and Entreprise said. Uh, there are no fix and all those appliances should go to, to trash. Uh, as a owner, obviously it's a difficult choice. So this box costs a bit more than 1,000 euros. Just the box and then you add all the fees. Um, so that's already clearly a cost for the owner. Uh, also from an ecological point of view, throwing all those boxes away just because you don't have a cloud authentication uh, is a bit um, is a bit sad, I would say. So we start looking at it, um, and it's what we how we start our journey. So the first thing we did was open the box, see what we do have inside. Uh, so this is a picture of the appliance that is there. Uh, so you can see that basically you have the big board that contains all the logic for the for the charging. With all the relay, you have the power that goes in and the power that goes to the car. Uh, you also have a small port to disc, to dialogue with the car and see uh, what is the the energy the car was expecting when to start and stop the, the charging. And then you have this small board on the top right with all the communication interface and. Um, what we start looking at. So you had initially, based on the, the data sheet, the product was foreseen with Wi-Fi that they enabled a bit before being a bankrupt, uh, Bluetooth low energy that we all discuss, and officially they support two open source uh, charging protocol, the one which is dressing is OCPP, which is the one they use uh, to dialogue with next move, essentially to upload uh, the quantity of energy that was consumed and, uh, and a bunch of telemetry. The other one is to ensure that you have a fair distribution when you have uh, pools of appliance, just to avoid that one, give all the power to one car and that the, the other weight, uh, they just distribute equally the amount of energy available. Uh, so all of that is standard protocol and that's also what was the intention of next move. Uh, we also have two ports, RS485 uh, and, uh, and a debug port that we did not investigate uh, more than that. Um, when you look on the other board, so we can see clearly the SP32 offering the Bluetooth low energy and, and Wi-Fi. They have a 4G modem as well, uh, which is a bit useless, but still there. Uh, some RFID chip for the authentication, um, as well as an ARM CPU and a bunch of EPROM and, and FRAM as well. So that's quite, quite a lot of interface available. Um, so the way we get access back, um, it was... I would say, as usual, a huge mix of, uh, of many things. A bit of luck, a bit of technical stuff, a bit of collaboration. So the first approach where we look at the network levels, uh, since we did not authentication on cloud, it was not super effective, even though it's HTTP protocol. So we started looking at the Bluetooth low energy. Fortunately, the app are still on Google Play Store and Apple App Store. So you can get both the installer and the customer app. Um, the, in the meantime, there were also two implementations that pops up. Um, one around this ESP Home, uh, which is a platform used to integrate with um, Home Assistant and, uh, and Gert Merzman that start reversing part of the Bluetooth low energy protocol. Um, and then there was another similar project uh, doing the same on the PKW um, board. There was also the, so there was part of reversing from the app, trying to understand the Bluetooth low energy commands and the way the app was communicating with the box, and it's what we describe a bit uh, after. Um, there was also the issue of authentication. How does the app authenticate with the appliance? 
Uh, and it's where we figure out uh, that, we also show that in a later slide, that the authentication between the app and the box was only done with a pin code. Uh, and the pin code was actually um, computed based on the model of the appliance as well as the serial number, which are visible on the appliance. So if you look on the appliance, uh, they have a sticker on it, uh, just somewhere there, which contain all the info you need uh, to generate the pin code. Oops. Uh, which is also creating some issue there because typically those info are public. In a way, if, if you can see the, if you can get access to the box, you can get access to the info you need for the pin code. So the pin code, the algorithm was retrieved. Also thanks with, uh, thanks with Benoit, uh, that helped there. And, uh, and again, all those ideas, all those person, uh, trying to find out how it works, uh, was the, the basis for the, the implementation of a, of a solution. Okay. Uh, I will enter in some technical details for those of you who are not familiar with the BLE protocol. So the first step is the advertise, what's called the advertising sequence. So that means every uh, BLE device advertise around it. Hmm? Uh, this kind of sequence, we'll enter into the detail. And there's the central, typically, for instance, your phone, if you're trying to connect to a BLE peripheral, uh, will be called the central in this case. So the, so there is a kind of loop, huh? the, the, the peripheral sends the advertising message all the time, and the central device starts in the scanning mode, huh? when you activate the function to try to connect to a BLE device. In the, uh, I will show the, the type of message which are sent, and but it, this, uh, during this scan sequence, what we try to get is to identify the peripheral, and to be sure that we connect to the right peripheral. Uh, so typically we will connect the MAC address and the device name. In this case we will use the device name and then we have to make the difference because there could be several EV chargers around in the one. and so we have to make sure we connect to the right one. Uh, when we are sure we, are con we have the, uh, connected to the, the peripheral, the, the central device stop the scanning sequence and will re-enter if the connection is lost. Can do <coughs> so the second step is to connect, to to establish the secure communication channel, to so create in the, the application the, the client, send the connect to device command, send the uh, step to the secure connection using the pin code, and then check, then we will check the connection, make sure that we actually connect it to the right. Uh, one, not to, to another one. And then we, this is done in comparing the characteristics, especially the serial number. And then we can enter the communication loop. Uh, basically, in this case, it will be initiating callback sequence. So the, the, the EV charger will send spontaneous message, even in response to commands. And uh, so the, uh, the application is completely asynchronous. There are about uh, six uh, uh, asynchronous process in it. And then also we'll send, we'll send periodic, uh, periodic time things. It was mentioned in a previous uh, talk, the, the issue that uh, some of EV charger lost the time. And it's a discourse uh, problem when uh, during day, daylight saving sequence change. So in this case we solve it because the, uh, the, the application is an NTP client and periodically resync the time to the DV charger. Okay, next slide. So th this is the description of the communication and then the, the, we enter to some very important when you speak about BLE uh, protocol. It's the the, what's called the GAT, uh, the generic attribute uh, profile, which describes the way uh, the data are exchanged between the peripheral and the central device. So, uh, typically, uh, you can have a, a command sent by the, the, the server, uh, by the, sorry, the, the, the central device, and the run answer. If this is a case where the connection is synchronous, and that's uh, what's done during the, uh, the scanning phase. But for this particular product, uh, it, it's asynchronous, as I mentioned, using callbacks. Uh, you can go to the, the next one. Yes. So this is a more description. So this is standardized. Hmm? 
uh, they define the profile, which includes, uh, which is breakdown into services, and every service includes a number of characteristics. Uh, typical characteristics as a, un as a unique uh, identifier, and the data, the data payload is 128 bits. So we'll have to pass that 128 bits to get back the data. Uh, a number of uh, UUID are standardized, and so you can find on the internet that a number of value are reserved for specific applications. But as a designer of a BLE application, you can also allocate your own UUID. And that's the case in this case because uh, EV charger are not yet uh, that standard. Next uh, slide. <clears throat> so the commands are sent in writing to a characteristics. Mm -hmm. And typically, we'll have the configuration parameters, uh, maximum current allowed, and so on. The time, as I just mentioned, and the start and stop charging commands. Uh, the response, uh, as also mentioned already, on, on notification, uh, and the results will have need to be passed. Uh, in the, this case, we use the, uh, the, the NIMBL uh, library, which is available on the net for the uh, ESP32 implementation. I did man forget to mention that for the application we use the same type of uh, processor module uh, that w which is also inside the EV charger. The reason is that uh, all the previous work done on, uh, by Gate was done on the same module. Libraries were available and it's a cheap solution. But of course it has some uh, uh, hardware limitation. I will come there back to that. And then uh, Design a small uh, printed 3D printed box to to save the device. Uh, yes, regarding the the software architecture, well, it's a 30 bit uh, processor. Uh, it's a SOC uh, with uh, about 300 kilobyte RAM, a bit more, a couple of megabytes PROM, uh, but outside of the SOC. And but there are another limitation, there is only one physical radio on this device, which is shared between the Bluetooth and the uh, and the Wi-Fi. Uh, the, the good news is that there are a lot of uh, of the shelf libraries, and uh, they all and the development environment uh, brings in the free ertos which uh, uh, runs in background. But in order not to have to modify those libraries and keep uh, a lot of for future uh, software updates, uh, we didn't change the libraries, use them as they are. So then comes with a number of limitations. So it's on the stack size, our process is limited to about 8 kilobytes. Uh, there are watchdogs linked to almost every, every type of uh, real-time functions. And as I mentioned already, we have a number of uh, parallel process running. Hmm? There is the, the TCP connection, the BLE, the connection, the Wi-Fi, the web server, the NTP client, the MQTT client, and the file system, which is uh, above the flash. So there is also uh, an issue there to avoid uh, wearing too fast uh, the, the, the flash. It's not a, 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 square, a square prompt. Uh, so th the solution was to make all the, those asynchronous, those tasks as short as possible in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the large, when I mean large, it's typically uh, more than 10 or 20 bytes. Uh, is or, or put in static buffers and uh, flags are used to synchronize the, between the processes. Okay, uh, yes, MQTT is a kind of bonus for the, for more, the more advanced user. Yes, I forgot to mention that our goal, because there, as David mentioned, there are other solutions available. The goal here was to have a solution for the layman, uh, who is completely lost, uh, uh, and we don't, even don't know what's an IP address, and uh, do have a very, very simple solution. So let's go to the demo, maybe. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> on the demo, the demo aspects. So obviously we are not able to bring a car in uh, in the room, uh, so it will be a, a video. Um, so clearly we screenshot. So the the first mode, uh, the way it starts, and again the the, the issue of the pin is also uh, the dimension is is also important. There. So when it starts, so the SP32 starts a web server, 
expose itself as an access point. You connect to it, and then it shows this configuration page where it basically asks for the product number that is in the box, the serial number that is in the box as well, host name, if should we want to send the host name, um, <coughs> and then the, the Wi-Fi settings uh, just to connect to, to, to wireless network and, and expose then the web interface which also, as the began much the web interface, not to have to develop any app, uh, which also means that when someone uses this solution, is not dependent on anyone any longer. He's on his own and at his own web server. Better not to expose to internet, uh, obviously. Um, then there was also the option to, uh, to set a fixed IP address and, and authentication. Um, so a small video on how it looks like when it's in operation, if I found the mouse. Okay, um, so when you get connected to it, it gives a bunch of settings that it says the car is plugged. So you have the echo mode, the max mode, the echo mode, it waits for energy to be available, so it waits a bit, and then the appliance decides what to do, so in this case, decide to charge up the uh, maximum amount of energy available. You can have an history, it was a bit too fast. Um, you can have an history of all your previous charge, which is super important if you are, um, if it's a car company and you need to uh, for your tax declaration, say so how much energy you consume for the car, so you need a registry. Um, we can also have statistics on the amount of energy that is available at the house level. Uh, okay, it's going to leave too fast. Uh, <coughs> my mouse. Okay, I will just slightly move back to the video. So charging, okay. So the history, as I said. Then here we have all the settings from the home, so the amount of energy um, that is currently available as well as the amount of energy is sending through the car uh, during charge. So you have sensor at the where basically the energy arrives to your house, and if you have solar panels, it's also look what's the amount of energy in which directions. Um, and it's all the, the appliance to the mass of do we have energy available for free that I need to inject to the car, or do I need to go to the grid, uh, and also they're taken into account uh, when uh, you need. So it's, was, it's quite well, well done to optimize uh, your energy bill and uh, auto consumption of, of energy. Uh, then the different settings. Um, by default, you have two modes, Echo Max and Private Open. So Echo means we use as much as possible the energy that is available in the house. <coughs> it was already forcing by power day. Um, Max is you use as much energy as possible without triggering the fuse. Uh, open is when you plug it, it charge. Uh, close, uh, private, uh, you only charge when you have authentication. And that's why there is also a user authentication mechanism for C in the app. Uh, so you can authenticate with your phone. Uh, since we, the reverse of the RFID was not uh, really successful uh, so far. Um, so it's, uh, again, the charging. So we Put again the demo, uh, and then you have a bunch of info on the, the charging station itself, uh, the version it runs, the IP address, the MAC address, um, and uh, and the model number as well as, as the revision. So that's how it looks like. And when you stop, just for a demo, it will uh, after a, a short while stop, and you can see that now it's stopped charging while the car is still plugged. Um, so that's how it looks like. Um, so MQTT, just for the demo, uh, very nice if you do have domotics or assistant or whatever else. Uh, you can retrieve the same kind of data straight to your um, to your home domotic uh, and then do the statistics and reporting out of there in, in most, more or less real time, so in real time. So that's for the, the implementation. Uh, so it should be a home owner. Uh, that means that now there are actually four solutions available. So one is to pay the subscription to next move. And there are definitely valid reasons to do that, and especially if you have a book, big pool of appliance, it doesn't seem to fit uh, the need of uh, home user. And that use case was not really forced by the by my Dego when they took <coughs> over the platform. And then you basically have three projects now that offer different type of feature, uh, but more or less they all offer the same minimal set of feature. So depending on your need and expertise, you can go for one or another. Uh, we'll put all the links uh, as well. So there was a big question for us on releasing all the co source code of it or not. Uh, and then we ran into quite uh, an issue since, as you have seen, the, it was designed with the intention to make it as simple as, it, as possible, um, which means that as soon as you have the pin code and the serial number, 
you can unlock any of those 50,000 appliances uh, that exist, that are installed. Some, some of them and quite a lot of them publicly available. Uh, I mean, publicly, physically available, not publicly available for charging. And you can uh, turn them into open mode and charge for free. Uh, and there is no fix, unfortunately, on that. The company went on bankrupt, and by design, uh, as soon as you know to generate the PIN code, you can authenticate. Uh, so due to that, uh, we decided not to release the code now, uh, just to avoid that someone could unlock all those appliances and instead pass um, pass to an official, well, of previous official uh, reseller of the appliance, so he is ensure that the the one that access the solution are the one that uh, legitimately own the box, and we put also some um, some fuse in the app, so you cannot change the pin code when it's set easily, just to avoid that again one would open all the appliances in Belgium and Luxembourg, which is absolutely not the intention. The other implementation um, since the split pin code generation from the rest um, did not release that part either with the exact same reason. Uh, so if you have an appliance, getting the pin code is, is, we can just ask and they will give you the pin code. We can give you the pin code of your, uh, but the intention is not to, to give the detail, uh, just to, to avoid that issue. Now, the, so that was for Pardale, and now we'll run into to actually what we were actually releasing with this call, this talk, sorry. What, so you might say what happened if Pardale is an exception and and uh, just, just a sad story, and it doesn't exist for others. Uh, unfortunately, that's the case, so we have a bunch of other cases. So Gigaset, uh, Siemens decided to stop all their appliances at some point without notice, and then suddenly people were stuck with their stuff. More or less, same kind of story, bankrupt, stopping cloud services. Uh, there was the same story with bikes in the Netherlands. Um, they cut the access, and again, people were uh, not unable to use the, their bikes until someone brings a solution uh, between in the same way. Uh, and it's um, it's more than annoying. And you have many and many other solutions. If you see, you have many IoT today that ask for having a cloud account first to use your app to do a local connection to your appliance, uh, which for us brings us to the big design flaw that you observe there, is that the infrastructure might not last as long as the product itself. And typically you should, in, if you design the product well, ensure that the basic set or the feature that doesn't need this cloud connectivity remains should you lose the cloud access. And typically this app could have worked without authentication. You would have lost the statistics on the report, but at least using the, yeah, the, the, the charger should have been feasible without uh, a cloud account. Uh, so that's clearly for us an issue. No local HTTP server, no local, no public APIs on the way uh, to save the box uh, without doing this, this effort of reversing. Um, you could also think it might be an interesting business to solve this kind of device. Um, we also discovered that it's a huge amount of effort. It took about eight months to come where we are and also building and on the work of others. So we have a bit of luck as well. Uh, and then you come to with the issue that when you deploy at scale, it's kind of a risky business. Uh, and there is quite a serious financial investment if you want to distribute some, so going from the POC to something that you can give away uh, is a huge effort. Um, so again, there was this idea that um, we should have devices that work without 4G or cloud connectivity when it's not required. A bike that should not need a cloud connectivity to run uh, or to be just started, I mean. Uh, on the legal track, uh, there is an interesting effort from the Commission on with the right to repair directive that doesn't completely cover these things. Uh, but we had this idea that from technician, uh, and it was also an idea, do we believe that it's actually acceptable to push a device that just become a useless piece of hardware at any time without any reason, at least any valid reason, just because of whatever? Uh, so their bankrupt is obviously a serious event, uh, but you may have many, many other things that do happen and that would have the exact same effect. Um, so again, food for thought, uh, no judgment, as I said, it's just what we're also willing to share and, and trigger a discussion and an idea there. Uh, just to conclude, um, so it was fun, definitely. We have reached our goal, so since this box work again, uh, we've learned a lot, I guess, um, and, and that was the message we were willing to, to bring on this idea that we believe that also with this uh, climate change, climate change uh, element, the, the need to consume less and make things last, that at least we should des design devices that last, at least, at least as long as they physically last, uh, we should have open API when it's feasible, and ideally even have code stored on escrow, so that if a company would bankrupt, somehow you can 
save the device and then rebuild something else if someone wants. Uh, so this idea of escrow, which existed in public market uh, in the past and which kind of disappeared. Uh, we have no magic solution there, uh, just sharing some ideas for thought. And just to conclude, if you want, you have email as you can reach us. Uh, and you have also the link with the, the two other implementations that you can pick, uh, so depending on your wish. You can go for one order, they're also very nice. And, um, and that's it. <laughs>